Excellent. Um, thank you all for coming today. Uh, this is my chance to chat with you guys, and this basically, unlike some of the other lectures which are sort of theoretical or focused on research or focused on cutting edge developments, this one is more of a show and tell. I've just kind of brought in some stuff that I kind of like playing with and I think is kind of cool and I think some of you might enjoy playing with too. Um, how many of you here have heard of an Arduino? Excellent, that's a lot of you. How many of you have actually tried doing some coding for Arduinos? Uh, very few of you. Okay, that's cool. Um, I'm going to basically talk to you about Arduinos and, and show you some example programs and how you go about programming, programming them. And if time permits, I'll show you something kind of neat, well, I think it's neat, on the hardware end of things. Um, who knows what an Arduino is? What's an Arduino? It's a microcontroller, essentially. Exactly. What's a microcontroller? Uh, no stuff. Yeah, that you kind program, of. Program and configure to control stuff. Yeah, basically, it's basically a little computer that controls stuff. And by some measures, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but by some measures, there are more microcontrollers out there, more little computers controlling stuff than any other kind of computer. More than desktops, more than tablets, more than even perhaps mobile phones are little computers that run things like dishwashers and car engines. They're sometimes called embedded controllers. And they're all over the place. There's one inside this screen, basically handling what the little buttons do on it. And there's one in that projector. And there's probably one in this projector as well. They're all over the place. There's definitely one in that camera. They're all over the place. And they're programmed just like big computers, just like desktop computers, and we're used to using desktop computers and tablets and mobile phones and programming those basically to make pixels appear on screens. That's what Mincy's lectures have been about, is making pixels appear on screens like this. But that's not the biggest part of programming by some measure. By some measure, the most programmers, or the most programmers in the world, are working on things that make lights turn on and off, that respond to switches, like on this device. And one of the companies that makes microcontrollers, that makes little computers for doing that, is a company called Atmel. And Atmel <laughs> makes a whole series of different processors. They're like the Intel or the AMD of the embedded controller world. They make little computers designed specifically to control things. And what an Arduino is, is a little computer designed to control things specifically aimed at an experimenter and hobbyist market. They're designed to be cheap and easy to use and easy to program so that anybody can buy these things. Uh, this particular one that I have here, and I'll just show it to you, that particular one there is something called an Arduino <laughs> Nano. There's a whole series of these little guys available. And you'll notice that unlike most computers, it has a lot of little pins on it. And that whole bunch of little pins that you see here um, at the top and at the bottom, those are designed to connect to electronic circuitry so that you can control things. And what I've got this particular one hooked up to is an LED right there, an external device. And if you like, you can think of that as perhaps being some car part. Maybe that's car lights or maybe that's some device. But this illustrates what it's like to control those sorts of things. Now, what we usually use to program these little Arduinos is software made by the Arduino team. And I'll just show you that here. And I'll fire it up on the screen. Hopefully that'll come up. And there's the Arduino software. And it comes up with a fairly uninspiring blank screen like that. But fortunately, I've written a few little programs for it already. 
to illustrate some of the things that it can do. So I'm going to load up one of those little programs that I've written already, which I have rather uninspiringly named Fade Zero. And it is a program to light an LED. That very LED that I showed you on the board there. And what I'm going to do is these things hook up with the USB lead, which you can see here. Um, the USB lead is used for two purposes. One purpose is to program the device. The other purpose is to power the device. And in fact, once you program the device with the code you want, you can unplug the lead and then plug it into any USB source, whether that plugs into the wall or plugs into a battery, and then use that to power the device. And the program that you wrote for it stays in non-volatile RAM so that you can run it without having to reprogram it each time. The program will live on it and stay on it. Now, as with many uh, sort of hobbyist gadgets, there is a certain amount of overhead involved in getting the thing configured. Under Windows, what we always have to do is go into the Device Manager and see what COM port <coughs> it is attached to. We're going to look at the COM ports here, and it should tell us what's connected. It says USB serial port COM7 is attached to a device. So we need to keep that in mind because we need to tell the Arduino programming environment that we are, in fact, on COM7. So I'll do that. I'll tell it's on COM7. I also need to tell it what kind of Arduino we're on. And there's a whole lot of different kinds of Arduinos. And if we look at the Arduino, as I mentioned before, it's an Arduino Nano. So we'll bring up the Arduino Nano here, which is right there. It's an Arduino Nano with an AppMega 328. That is one of Atmel's driver <coughs> controller chips. And now everything should be ready with any luck, to program that device with this little program. Now before I do so, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what this program does. It is programmed in a language specific to Arduinos that, without going into too much detail, is basically a stripped down version of C++. There are some limitations compared to a typical C++ implementation. And for most programming purposes, you can just think of it as being C. You just basically program the thing in C. And it's fairly simple. Now, on this particular board, I can, if I want to, hook up a red LED, a green LED, and a blue LED. Without going into too much detail, those numbers correspond to the particular pin on the, net, the Arduino that the LED is plugged into. So if we look back at the uh, Arduino here, you can see that the LED is hooked up through a resistor here from pin 9. You can see that resistor right there that's hooked up to a leg on the LED. From there it connects to a wire that connects back to the positive power supply, 5 volts on that particular device. And in fact, you can see if I turn the light out here, you can see there's a blue light on the device that indicates it is now powered on by USB, but it's not doing anything. If you look at the LED here, there's a bit of a reflection on it, but it's not actually lit at the moment. Now I'll go back to the program here. And you can see the program here connected to pin 9. It's the red LED. I have assigned a variable called LED the green LED. I have a variable here specifying the brightness. It varies from 0 to 255. 0 means the LED is off. 255 means it's fully on. And here in this setup routine, which we have to have, and in fact the comment says so, setup routine runs once when you press reset or power it on. What I have to do is tell it that the particular pin on the Arduino that is connected to the LED is going to be used to send output. I'm going to be able to send a signal over it, in effect. And then what I will do is write that value out to that LED. And that's the whole thing the program does. It doesn't do anything more than say set 255 
on the pin that the LED is connected to, which basically means <laughs> allow current to flow through it. That's all it does. And let's see if that, in fact, works. I'm going to push the button here that uploads the program to the Arduino. And hopefully that'll work. It'll take a little while to compile, and then with any luck, and this of course could go horribly wrong, it will send that to the Arduino. It's now finished uploading, and with any luck, it should send that program. And in fact, I think it has. Let's take a look at the visualizer. Lo and behold, our green LED is brightly lit at the top of the screen. So that worked. So let me review a little bit more. And you can see that actually worked successfully. So that's pretty cool. We can turn on an LED. Well, it, it's kind of cool and simultaneously kind of useless because we probably could have hooked up that LED and its current limiting resistor to a battery and achieved just as much for all that's worth. Well, I suppose if we wanted to, we could, say, go back to the program here and pick a different LED. Let's see what the red one looks like. Set that to pick the pin that the red one is on. I'll save that program. Let's uh, watch the uh, visualizer here and we'll see if that works. I think we'll turn that off. Probably be a little clearer. And we'll try sending that program. It'll take a few seconds. We'll wait. We'll wait. And hopefully that'll switch over. Now programming it. See the flashing lights that show it's being programmed, and then lo and behold, it lights up red. And in fact, if you look over here, you can see it's red. So that's pretty obvious, pretty straightforward, no real surprises there. Now, the fun begins, assuming you think this sort of thing is fun, and I do, when we actually start creating slightly more complicated programs. And so last night, just playing around with this, I thought I'd do something a little bit more complicated and a little bit more interesting, which is to write a program that varies the brightness. Remember I said that I can send a 255 out over that particular output pin. Uh, well, actually I send 255 minus the brightness that I want because it actually works in inverse, zero for this particular arrangement of wiring fully powers the LED on, and 255 actually powers it off, so it's the inverse. But you can think of the brightness as varying from 0 to 255, and so what I've created here is a little program that initially just sets the LED pin to being an output pin. If we don't do that, nothing goes out. And then there's another routine that we always need in every Arduino program in this language, we have something called loop. Now loop is kind of neat because it's exactly what it says on the tin. As long as that program is running, we will be in a loop. It will automatically be like a program that's nothing more than while true. Just loops around and around and around effectively. And what we'll do in this loop is we'll set the brightness of the LED based on our brightness variable. And if we reach either end, if we reach either being completely off or completely on, we'll switch direction. So it'll go nice and bright, and then we'll switch direction, and it'll get dim again. And then once it's dim all the way, we'll switch direction and get bright again. That, if you look at this piece of code, is exactly what it does. And let's see if it works. I'll first make sure that I'm still connected to what I want, COM7, Arduino Nano. Occasionally, it will for reasons mysterious, uh, lose its settings. And let's see if that works. We'll keep an eye on the LED, and we'll see what happens. I've got it hooked up to the green LED, by the way, so we'll see if that turns green. And it's programming board now. You can see the lights flashing on the board that indicate it's being programmed. And there we go. It pulses. Now, the previous example, just lighting an LED, you could do with a battery if you wanted to do this with discrete circuitry, with some transistors and other gadgets and ICs and so forth, well, you could, but now you'd be spending a lot of time designing electronics and debugging electronics, which is a lot harder than debugging software. 
So in a lot of ways, doing this kind of thing, using a microcontroller to control devices, is a lot easier, technically, than doing it using discrete hardware. So there we go. Now we've got a green LED flashing. That is pretty cool. Well, I think it's pretty cool. Now let's go back to the example here. Now you'll note there's this delay down here that basically controls the speed of the program as it goes through the loop. We can, of course, change that. We can make things go much slower by increasing the value, or we can make things go uh, much faster. Let's see what happens. And I'm just experimenting here. Let's see what happens if we replace that with 5. I'll save that. I'll start that compiling. And we'll take a look back at the display, and we'll see what it does once the programming has finished. Now programming it, uploading the program to the device. And there we go pretty much what we'd expect. Let's see what happens if we set that to zero. This will give us a good idea of the speed of the device. And let's program it again. And it'll take a few minutes to program. That's still the previous program running. And it's programming it. And lo and behold, it's flashing pretty much fast enough that you can't even see it. Uh, if you move your eyes back and forth quickly, you'll notice that there's a bit of a flickering going on there. Uh, but basically, it's fast enough that it appears to be on pretty much steadily. Now, that's something worth keeping in mind, this idea that a flashing LED can flash fast enough that you don't actually notice the flashing. Because one of the things that I'm going to show you today actually relies on that effect. Make sure I have enough time, I do indeed. So keep that in mind, that a flashing LED can flash fast enough that you don't notice the flashing. That's an effect called persistence of vision. Your eye basically fills in the flashes so that you don't notice that it's actually flickering. Um, notice it a little bit, but in this particular case it's kind of hard to say. Now let's go back to our programs again and bring up yet another example. Bring up two. Now, one thing I should point out about this LED is that it's actually, if we take a look at it here, um, it's actually three LEDs in one. Multicolor. It's multicolor, exactly. It's a standard multicolor LED. They're used in all sorts of gadgets and lighting devices these days. It's actually three individual LEDs in one. It's a red LED, a green LED, and a blue LED. I think you haven't seen the blue color yet. But they're all in there together. So an obvious question then is once you start playing around with one of these is you think, hmm, wouldn't it be neat to take control over all three colors at once and fade them in and out. That should be really cool. Let's see what that looks like if we do so. So, we'll go back to the laptop here and take a look at this example where I've taken into account all three colors at once and instead of fading just one of the LEDs within the LED package, we're going to fade all three at once. Is that why there are three resistors? That's why there are three resistors. That's why there are three resistors. Because it's actually three separate LEDs in one physical package. And in fact, if I had more time, what I would have liked to do as a demo is actually start out with three separate physical LEDs and then pop them out and replace them with the one. But I figured now that'll probably take too much time. So I just used the one through tricolor LED package. It's really three LEDs in one package. So let's see what this looks like. Let's try it. We're going to fade three LEDs at once. And let's take a look on the visualizer. It's compiling as we speak, and now it's programming it. And there we go. Of course, you mix all three together. You mix all three together, and of course, if you mix red and green and blue in equal proportion, you wind up with pure white. 
And actually, it looks pretty pure white on here, which is a nice effect of the blurring of the screen. If you look at it from down here, where I am, first of all, it's bright enough to make my eyes hurt. But second of all, you can actually see the three individual LED components that are inside there. I don't know if we can see them there, but you can actually see the individual color components. You can see the green color. You can see a lot of green. I mean, part of that is because I haven't gone to any effort to balance the three colors. And I could do by tweaking the resistor values or by tweaking my program. I haven't bothered at all. There's very little point of it. And of course, now, you might be thinking, well, that's pretty cool. If you have a whole bunch of those tricolor LEDs, you should be able to make a vast screen. Because red, green, and blue are what are used to make up a pixel in an image. And indeed, you can. They do make commercially very large displays, jumbotron-type displays, that consist of these tricolor LEDs controlled by fairly standard hardware. So I, that's kind of cool. Now, obviously, just controlling it over three colors simultaneously so that it lights up white isn't particularly interesting. What would be really nice to be able to do is control the colors individually. And of course you can. I mean, if we wanted to just sort of hack the program a little bit, we can just take out one of the colors or we can change its value in some way. In fact, let's do this. Let's take out the 255 minus brightness so the green is going to be completely out of sync with the rest of the colors. Let's upload that and see what it looks like. So it should be when the rest of the colors are getting dim, the green should be getting bright. There, it's programming it and let's see what results now. It is kind of cool. It's, uh, you know, and if you look at it here, I don't know if you can see it from there. You might be able to see the colors a little better. But it's still not particularly interesting. And it tends to kind of overload um, this a little bit. Let me just see if I can adjust the brightness on this device. And maybe the um, color will show up a little bit better. Yeah, that's probably just a little bit better. So focus on it a little bit. There we go. Well, that's kind of cool. but. What we'd really like to be able to do is vary the colors in a much more interesting fashion. In fact, what we'd like to be able to do is, say, go from red and then sort of merge into a mix of red and green and then into green and then into a mix of green and blue and then blue and then come back to red and blue and so on and have it actually go through a whole spectrum of colors that would probably look pretty cool. And so that, in fact, is exactly what I did here in example fade three. So what I did was set it up to color cycle, to go through the different colors. And what's interesting about that is that in order to do that, we use a slightly different representation of color. Because I thought what would be ideal is to specify the color with a value from 0 to 255. So say 0 is the most red, and maybe 255 is the most green, or maybe 128 is the most green, and it comes around at 255 back to red again. And so I did a little bit of Googling on that. Well, actually, I didn't. I knew about this already. I did some Googling afterwards to find the specific algorithm. Turns out there is a model of color that already does that, and it's something called hue saturation value. If you've done web programming, you're probably used to specifying colors in terms of RGB values. You specify an amount of red, an amount of green, and an amount of blue. And that's great for that kind of thing, but it doesn't work very well for most purposes where we want to quantify color on a spectrum. Or we want to say that, as I mentioned, red is 0 and green is 128 and back to red is 255. Now that's exactly what hue saturation value does. It's a different way of representing color where the actual hue is represented by the H value. The saturation, or how pure the color is, is represented by an S value. 
and the rather uninspiringly named value, value represents the brightness. Uh, sometimes they call it luminosity. Sometimes they call it luminosity. I've used the term brightness just to keep things simple, but yes, that is what it is sometimes called. Uh, it is sometimes called uh, luminosity. That's correct. So now what I've done with my program here is instead of varying the brightness of an individual LED, I've done exactly the same thing and I am varying a hue value. And I'm just basically running that from 0 to 255 and when it reaches 255, starting back over at 0. The key ingredient here is that I am converting the hue value to an RGB value using this standard routine. And if you actually want to read through how it works, that's entirely up to you. Far better, you should just Google for how that works, and you'll find uh, HSV to RGB conversions and RGB to HSV conversions spread all over the internet. So you can find those easily, should you be interested in precisely how that algorithm works. Suffice to say, I have used it, and uh, used it to implement this little demo or the few changes. So let's see what that looks like uh, when you run it. So I will upload that, and we'll switch back to the visualizer here so we can see what it does once it's programmed a little beastie. There it goes, it's programming it. And there we go. And you can see it shifting color. If you actually look at it up here, this kind of oversaturates the color, and it's a bit hard to see, but if you look at it down here, you can probably see a little bit better that it's shifting through colors. And if you'll notice in various gift shops and novelty shops and things like Red 5, you will see color shifting gadgets like this all over the place. Mm -hmm. They're a thing. How do they work? They are precisely this. They are probably an Atmel Atmega controller paired with an RGB LED and three resistors all bundled up into a spherical frog light or whatever it is that you happen to buy for five quid and they're doing precisely this. Some of them will have some little input buttons and there'll be a little piece of the software that says if button such and such is pressed then switch mode but this is precisely the kind of hardware that those devices are built from. No different to this program in almost exactly the same way as developing this little gadget. So there we go. Um, that's that particular gadget. I'd like to move to a second gadget, and just for convenience sake, I wired that up using a separate Arduino, and it uses a slightly different lead just to make things uh, slightly irritating. So I'm going to switch leads here. Plug this one in. This one uses a micro USB instead of a mini USB, just to keep things interesting. Look <coughs> that. I don't recall whether I've actually got a program running on it or not. It's told at the moment. So I said I just kind of pick this up off my desk at home. Ah, there we go. That does have a program running on it. I'll just let that run a little bit so you can see what it does. Watch it for a bit and you can tell me what that little program is doing. Absolutely. That is precisely what it's doing. It's not particularly imaginative or wondrous. It is counting in hexadecimal and in fact it's a good illustration of exactly the same kind of digital display that these days is in every calculator, every digital watch, every microwave oven, the front panel of every dishwasher or washing machine, the dashboard of your car or motorcycle, and pretty much every piece of electronic test equipment that has been built since the mid-1970s has used the display precisely like this one. Now you might wonder why would I ever bother creating a program to implement something like that. It seems like an utter waste of time. And in fact in a lot of ways it is. This is purely an amusement. Um, it serves no useful purpose. I do have in mind 
building out of this some useful things, but at the moment all it does is that. The interesting thing to me about it is that it reveals something about these standard little <coughs> LED-based digital displays that you might not actually know. And it's something that if you've encountered them before, I'm just going to turn the light back on if it'll let me here so we can see some things. If you look at the number of wires going into the device, and I'll explain a little bit how these displays work. They actually consist of seven LEDs arranged like this. Each one of those is an individual LED. You can number them like that if you want to, four, five, six, seven, and sometimes a decimal point as well. Which means if you have multiple displays hooked up together, you're going to then have 14 LEDs that you've got to control and 14 plus 7 LEDs that you've got to control. What's 14 plus 7? 21. Exactly. And 21 plus 7? 28. Exactly. Can you imagine on your average little pocket calculator how many individual wires you'd have to have in order to wire all those up? Think about it a minute. You'd suddenly have a whole festival of little wires going in and out of the device, wouldn't you? Well, there is a way of simplifying it slightly. You can at least connect, because every LED has two connections on it, one and two, positive and negative, because every LED is arranged that way, but you also need a resistor to control the current. and you also need a resistor to control the current, you're absolutely right. <coughs> So, for every LED, you can actually tie one end of them all together. So here we can tie one end all together and say ground them all together. So that saves you a little bit of wiring, the fact that you can tie one end of them all together. But if you want to light up the segments individually, you still need essentially eight wires, one ground, and seven individual segment leads. So you still need seven leads plus seven leads plus seven leads plus seven leads for all the displays that you've got. Now I want you to take a close look at this pair of LED displays here. They are completely individual LED displays. How many wires are going in and out of this display band? Count them here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, eight, nine. I think that's right. Seven, eight. Is it maybe ten? I'm not sure. I think I've got the decimal points wired up. How many wires are going in and out of that? Count them. Ten? Exactly. And we do have decimal points here. So those are wired up. I don't have them displayed at the moment, but they're there. Let's in fact turn the light off so we can see the lights again. <clears throat> so, an obvious question should be, if I've got two seven-segment displays, which are showing completely individual numbers, they're showing different numbers, this proves it, they are different numbers, how have I managed to get away with less than 14 wires? In order to address every single lit segment individually, I should need 14 wires plus some. How do you think it works? Is it using the, the fact that it can flash faster than your eye? Excellent answer. That is precisely the case. Every LED display like this, whether it's two digits or 20 digits, like a big desktop calculator, does something called multiplexing, which is actually a very clever scheme where what it's actually doing is only lighting up one of these displays 
at a time. And so what it's doing is lighting up this one and then lighting up that one, lighting up this one and lighting up that one. And in fact, all of the segments on the display, all corresponding segments are tied together. So if we have a display like this, What we do is tie those two together, and that represents that topmost segment. And we tie these two together, and that represents the left segment. And we tie those two together, and that represents the bottom left segment. And we tie those two together. Now the diagram is almost impossible to understand. Every corresponding LED segment is tied together. <coughs> And if we actually look at the code, now I'm not going to go through the code in detail, but this is basically a C++ class that I wrote that is designed to drive any number of seven-segment displays, assuming all of their individual segments are tied together, but the grounds for each display are independent. You do need a schematic with this program. You're right. But that's what's cool about electronics and computers is you get to both write code and schematics. So it's like two completely different incompatible notations that you get to play with. It, you know, we kind of did this lecture in the wrong order. I should have done this one right before David Evans' lecture on field programmable gate arrays. Because, in fact... David's lecture on field programmable gate arrays gets away from all of this stuff. I've had to wire up stuff by hand. A field programmable gate array gives you essentially a box with all the circuitry in it inside a chip and driving all the LEDs. And then you program it with software, kind of. And it lets you do all of the circuitry stuff in the software, in effect instead of having to wire it up by hand. But basically, as I mentioned, this is a class that I wrote, and I'll put it up on Blackboard so you guys can download it if you're interested. This is a class that I wrote that basically handles the multiplexing <coughs> and control of seven-segment displays. And actually, down at the bottom, it just boils down to this little program here where I define a seven-segment display I tell it how many display units there are. In this case, it's got two display units and some other stuff, which we can ignore for now. And then we have uh, a value incremented and displayed on both displays. And then we have a delay here so that it doesn't go too fast. <laughs> now, what's neat about the delay is I can change the value, and we can see very quickly what effect that has on the display rate. Now one thing I have to do before I fire this up is I need to make sure I've connected it up the right way because this is potentially on a different COM port. Let's just find out. Arduino Micro is on COM 11. So it has jumped because I switched things around and so I have to tell it first of all that it's an Arduino Micro and I have to tell it that it's now on COM port 11. So now we should be able to program it. So I will uh, send it this program. It's already got the program running on it, but I've changed the delay. And I shall upload it. Hopefully that will work. And we'll see what effect that has on the display. Now it's programming the device. You can see it programming it. The lights flash on the device as it's programmed. Now look at that. You can actually see the fact that it is toggling back and forth in every single LED display, bar very few used on specialty equipment, do exactly this. And in fact, once you've realized that every LED displays this, you, you kind of get in the habit of going around and looking at LED displays. And if you sweep your vision past them very quickly, you'll notice that they're actually flickering. And in fact, for a lot of displays, you, you actually start to see the flickering itself, and you realize that they're going sequentially. By the way, if anyone uh, suffers from epilepsy, 
uh, you probably want to look away. Um, let's increase the delay a little bit more, and it makes the effect even more obvious. I'm just reprogramming it now. It'll come up in a moment or two. Reprogramming it, it's compiling it, it is now uploading it. Program's being uploaded, and now the program will run. Now you can see the effect even more clearly how it actually works. It's addressing each one independently. Every LED display does that. If you've got an LED watch, that's what it's doing. Microwave display, that's what it's doing. Dashboard of your car, that is what it's doing. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is my quick introduction to microcontrollers and the Arduino. Thank you very much.